But I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them, to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Um, if you have one of our Bibles from the back, one of the smaller ones, that's on page 838. 838. For those who are visiting with us, we've been working our way through the Gospel of Mark, uh, just preaching it section by section. And we come to chapter 3, verses 20 to 35 this afternoon. 20 to 35. So Mark chapter 3, starting at verse 20. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul. And by the prince of sins, he casts out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man in whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And the crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of God. Family. Family is a word that can bring up many different thoughts and feelings for different people. Now, we all acknowledge that family is an important word, but for some people, it brings up thoughts and memories that are full of sadness, full of, full of bitterness, full of pain. Well, for others, it brings up memories that are full of happiness and warmth. But for all of us, we recognize family has left a mark upon us. Well, the scriptures also have much to say about family. However, it's quite striking the way that the Bible, and particularly the New Testament, while it certainly doesn't minimize our natural earthly family, it's striking how it emphasizes the priority of spiritual family. And that can be incredibly comforting. I think about the world in which we live with so many broken homes, so many broken families. And the scripture confronts us with the reality that whatever our family background might be, whatever good or bad memories we might have, the message of Christ is that every single person can come to know the blessing of family in the deepest and fullest way imaginable. That every single person can be, if they will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, can be adopted into the family of God and experience full and eternal intimacy with Christ and with his people. Now, as we come again in our study to Mark's gospel, that's really the theme that we're confronted with. Now, just to remind you as we place ourselves in, in our context, we are near the beginning of a section that stretches into chapter 6. And it's a section that really highlights again and again the spiritual division that Christ's kingdom introduces into humanity. Now, in the previous passage, we saw the difference between being part of an excited crowd that is watching Jesus and actually being a disciple chosen by Jesus. Well, in this passage, the reality of spiritual division continues 
between those who oppose Christ's ministry and those who submit to it. And we're faced here with a contrast between the great danger of opposing Christ through unbelief and the blessed intimacy of submitting to him through faith. However, as Mark impresses this contrast on us, he highlights the priority of spiritual family. You see, in Mark's mind, in Christ's mind, the most important thing in the world is not the question, who is your natural family? The most important question you can ask is, who is your spiritual family? Are you a part of Satan's household? Are you a part of Christ's family? I want to look at this passage in three scenes. First, we have the blindness of Christ's earthly friends. And we have the blasphemy of Satan's plundered household. And we have the blessedness of Christ's true family. So first in verses 20 and 21, we have the blindness of Christ's earthly friends. The blindness of Christ's earthly friends. Look at verse 20. Then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. So up to this point, we have seen the increasing excitement that surrounds Christ and his ministry. Ever since chapter 1, we have been given frequent in indications that the crowds that have been following him and pressing in on him have grown bigger and bigger and bigger. And here we see how extreme things are getting. Everywhere Christ goes, he is swarmed by the crowds to the point that he doesn't even have time or room to sit and eat and have a meal. And we read in verse 21, When his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he is out of his mind. Now it's important for us to realize here that the word for family, translated literally, simply means those with him or those for him. It's used in the Greek to speak of those who are intimately connected to, to someone. And so there is some debate whether this is referring to um, family or, or relatives or kinsmen or friends. It's possible that it's referring to his mother and his brothers who will be referred to in verse 31, but it doesn't necessarily require that. It could simply be referring to a wider, wider circle of friends and relatives. In any case, what we see here is that they hear what's going on and they become concerned. And so they come up from Nazareth to seize him. Now, this doesn't mean, as, as we say, as they say, he's out of his mind. This doesn't necessarily mean that they thought something has snapped in Jesus' brain. He's become a raging lunatic. Again, the word is somewhat ambiguous. It could simply mean he's, he's confused. But the impression is simply that they're hearing the reports of what is going on and they are becoming increasingly concerned about Christ's mental state. He is making incredible claims for himself. He's setting himself up in opposition again and again and butting heads with the religious leaders. In verse 9, we're told that the crowds around him were so heavy that at times he was in danger of being crushed. In verse 20, we see that he's in danger of ruining his health because he doesn't even have time to eat because of the busyness of his ministry. And his relatives hear about what is happening and they grow worried about him. Jesus is getting carried away with religious fervor. He's being overtaken by delusions of grandeur because of his sudden popularity. And he's not in his right mind. We're concerned if we let Jesus go on like this, he's going to hurt himself, and he's probably going to bring shame on the family. So they determine that they need to head up to Capernaum and restrain him by force, if necessary. And so essentially what we're seeing here, I want you to realize, is the well-meaning attempts of sympathetic friends to basically protect Jesus from himself. That's their mindset. We are, we are friends of Christ, and we need to protect him from himself. However, I want you to realize two things. What ultimately lay at the root of their thinking was a skepticism about who Jesus was. They didn't believe that he was the Son of God. There was this spiritual blindness that made them think, Jesus needs us to protect him. We need to restrain him, otherwise he's going to do something harmful and dishonoring. And what lay at the root of it was unbelief. 
The second thing we need to see is that the result of their unbelief was that they tried to restrain or seize him. So this may not have been coming from a place of antagonism, but I want you to see the end result of their thinking was to oppose the ministry of Christ. Now, these were the friends. These were the relatives of Christ. They grew up with him. They knew him. They knew his history. And yet here they are at this point, acting out of a place of unbelief and spiritual blindness. In their response, we are given a sad picture of skeptical unbelief. They may have been well-meaning. They may have been sympathetic. But because they weren't acting out of faith, all they could do is oppose the kingdom of Christ. My friend, scripture tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. I can't help but think of liberal Christianity. They claim to, be, to have affection for Christ. They claim to want to help Christ and honor him and, and build the kingdom. And yet because unbelief in who Jesus is, the Son of God who came for sinners, because unbelief is at the root, all they can ever do is essentially oppose the kingdom of Christ. Let's move on. We'll come back to that. We'll, we'll refer to that again as we go on. But let's move on. Because there's another kind of unbelief and opposition in this passage. We see not only the blindness of Christ's earthly friends, but secondly, in verses 22 to 30, we see the blasphemy of Satan's plundered household. The blasphemy of Satan's plundered household. Look at verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and... By the prince of demons, he casts out demons. So Christ's family is coming up from Nazareth, and at the same time, the scribes are coming up from Jerusalem. And as they hear about what's going on, and they maybe watch Christ for a time, they begin to spread a twofold charge against Christ. First, he's possessed by Beelzebul, which is basically another word for Satan, the prince of demons. And secondly, it is by Satan's power that he is casting out demons. Now, we're going to come back to Christ's family in verse 31, but I want you to recognize Mark interjects this, this story of conflict with the scribes with the purpose of making a sobering comparison. If there was unbelief in Christ's family, there was a much more deeply settled unbelief in the religious leaders. His family was saying, what he's doing is crazy. The scribes were saying what he is doing is satanic and evil. Well, Christ responds to the twofold charge of the scribes with two parables. In the first, he really exposes the falseness of their accusation. In the second, he gives them the true explanation for his miracles. Look at verse 23 to 26. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. What Christ is essentially doing is he is showing the absurdity of claiming that he is casting out demons while possessed by Satan. And the reasoning is extremely simple. And it's extremely logical. Jesus says it's a simple fact of life that a kingdom with deep divisions within itself loses its power and influence in the world. And it is very close to coming crashing down. A household divided against itself cannot be established with any kind of influence. Why would Satan overthrow his own strongholds to think Satan would say, OK, demon, I want you to go possess that person and then to follow it up with someone else to say, get out and run. It's absurd. And that's essentially what Jesus is saying. It's absurd to say that Satan would be behind a ministry focused on destroying the strongholds of Satan. And Christ follows this up with a second parable, giving the true explanation of his ministry. In verse 27. 
He says, but no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Now again, the logic is very simple. If you want to break into the, the house of a strong and courageous man while he is present, there's only one way to go about it. First, you have to fight the man. You have to beat him up. You have to tie him up. And then you can take anything out of his house that you want. Again, a very, very simple parable. And Christ is saying, here I am. I'm going around casting out demons. I'm setting free those who are held by Satan's power. I'm restoring life to bodies and to souls. And it's very, very evident that I can do this, not because I'm in league with Satan, but because in myself, I have power and authority and I have overcome Satan. You see, in Christ, the kingdom of God had broken into the world. And with the kingdom of God coming, the power of Satan over men was coming to an end. Christ's ministry of healing, the fact that demons were being cast out, was intended to be a bright flashing testimony to the fact that the kingdom had come in Jesus Christ. We saw this back in chapter 1. Jesus had already overcome Satan, the temptations in the wilderness. And when he had returned from the wilderness, he had done so in the power of the Holy Spirit. And everything Jesus did in his ministry to plunder the goods of Satan, he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's saying it is only willful blindness, willful blindness that would refuse to see this. I want, to, I want you to think of that striking image, though. That image of Christ's power and authority. Here is Satan. He is a strong man. Satan wields terrible spiritual power in this world. The power of evil, the power of sin, the power of deception. Scripture calls Satan the God of this world. He has power. He has influence in this world. And that was very clearly seen in Jesus' day by the fact that human lives were being destroyed by demon possession. And it's very, very clear in our world today by lives that are destroyed by sin and by evil and by lies. But Jesus is saying here that with my coming, Satan has been bound so that he can no longer stop his goods from being plundered. And brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't that a glorious thing for us to remember? We are called to go in Christ's name into a world that is under the power of evil. But by Christ's word and authority, we have the authority to tear down strongholds of sin. To set free souls bound by evil. Ravaged and broken under the merciless hatred of the devil. We go proclaiming the kingdom of the king of grace. And he breaks strongholds. And Satan can't stop us. Evil cannot resist the advance of the kingdom of Christ as we go forth in the name of Jesus Christ. But Christ doesn't stop with just his explanation. As Christ goes on, he gives a very solemn warning to the scribes. Look at verse 28 to 30. He says, Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. And we call this the unforgivable sin, the sin against the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is using it here as a warning to the scribes, and he's focusing on, on the gravity and the uniqueness of this one sin. I want you to realize verse 28 is actually an incredible statement about the far-reaching nature of God's mercy. Jesus says all sins are pardonable. Whatever blasphemies men utter, they can be forgiven. However, Jesus notes these things to highlight the fearfulness of this one exception. All sins can be forgiven, but there is one exception. What is this sin? I want you to think about it in the context. What are the scribes doing? 
Jesus has damaged their pride. Jesus has exposed their hypocrisy, and they have set themselves to oppose his ministry. I want you to realize these were experts in the law. These were men who knew the scriptures extremely well. They had no excuse for not recognizing the kingdom of God when it came in Christ. And Christ's miracles were were intended to authenticate his preaching. What the scribes are doing is they are hardening themselves against the clear witness of the miracles. And they are trying to turn other people away from Christ. Verse 30 implies an ongoing action. They were saying, this wasn't something that they gathered together and one of them threw it out as a suggestion. This had become their settled opinion. They were telling the crowds, this is why, this is how he's doing it. So my friends, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is essentially a resolute, willful resistance to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It is standing face to face with the undeniable truth and power of God and setting yourself willfully against it. J.C. Ryle put it this way. He says it's a combination of clear intellectual knowledge of the gospel with deliberate rejection of it and a willful choice to sin. It's a union of light in the head and hatred in the heart. You see, in the face of that kind of willful rejection, the Holy Spirit comes to a point where he withdraws. He leaves a soul in their hardness, in their sin, and in their unbelief. Now, please recognize people often with tender consciences sometimes wrestle with the question, well, how do I know I haven't committed it? Is there still forgiveness for me? My friends, if that's a question that you ask, for such people like that, we say, if you find yourself anxious about it, if you sincerely want forgiveness, it is a clear proof that you have not committed it. It doesn't matter how terrible your sins might have been. If there remains in your heart a desire for forgiveness and restoration, you have not committed the unforgivable sin. You see, it's not the greatness of the sin But it's the hardness of the heart that makes this sin unforgivable. My friends, God's mercy is big. And that's one of the emphases of the passage. All sins can be forgiven. All blasphemies. Peter denied Jesus Christ three times. And yet he was forgiven. Paul persecuted the church of Jesus Christ. And he was forgiven. David, sinning against light, he had walked with God. He'd received so much grace, so much light. And he committed adultery, premeditated adultery and murder. And he continued unrepentant for a time, yet he was forgiven. All sins and blasphemies can be forgiven in Christ. But what makes this sin different is the willful, settled hatred of God. Hatred of the gospel. Knowing opposition to the Holy Spirit. We need to be very careful about labeling people with a sin. But I do think we've seen, probably, possibly, you know people like this. I went to a man, I went to Bible school with a man who at that time appeared extremely zealous for the Lord. I looked up to him as a man of faith, as a role model. Since that time, he has apostatized from the gospel. And if you follow his social media account now, he he actively ridicules Christianity. And he tries actively to turn people from the gospel. This is the kind of thing that Jesus is talking about. And it's a warning of extreme gravity to the scribes who are standing on the brink of it. Beware of your willful hardening against the light. Beware of your active opposition to the kingdom. My friends, I want us to realize what Mark is doing here. I said earlier that Mark is drawing a comparison between the well-meaning response of Christ's family and friends and the hostile opposition of the scribes. I want you to realize there's not only comparison here, but there's actually a parallel here. Because whether the charge be one of madness or one of wickedness, both of these responses come from a place of unbelief 
And both of them lead to opposition to Christ's ministry. And Mark is intentionally connecting the two because he wants to emphasize, my friends, this is the ultimate end of all unbelief. It is hindrance to the work of God. It leaves you as a member of Satan's household and it leads to eternal destruction. You may not be on the brink of committing the sin against the Holy Spirit, but I want you to realize whatever the level of your willfulness might be, to persist in unbelief in Jesus Christ, to continue in opposition to him, the final end of that is eternal destruction. That's the weight of Christ's words here. Beware of unbelief. Beware of opposing Christ because it leads to death. And realizing that fact needs to give us a sense of urgency. Urgency to seek forgiveness without delay. Because unless you're so hardened that you actually don't even care about forgiveness, the offer of forgiveness is open before you today. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Forgiveness for unbelief, for sin, even for blasphemy. And it is found in Jesus Christ. He's not a madman and he's not a satanic deceiver. He is the son of God crucified for sinners. And he has authority on earth to forgive sins. Well, let us go on because Mark finishes with a final contrast. We've seen the blindness of Christ's earthly friends. We've seen the blasphemy of Satan's plundered household. But third in verses 31 to 35, we see the blessedness of Christ's true family. The blessedness of Christ's true family. Look at verse 31 and 32. And his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And the crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. So after the conflict with the scribe, Mark returns his attention to the situation with Christ's family. Now, again, it's not entirely clear whether Mary and, and Jesus' brothers were the ones talked about in verse 30 or 21, making the claim that he's out of his mind, but it is possible. If that's the case, I don't think we need to say that Mary necessarily was actively thinking that Christ had lost his mind. Christ, Mary was clearly a woman of faith. But we do know that Jesus' brothers, until the resurrection, didn't believe in him. In any case, his mother and his brothers come to where he was. They see the house crowded and they call to him. So you can picture the scene. You go to the house and it's crowded to capacity. They can't squeeze in. So they send out, you know, it's the telephone game. You whisper a message to the person at the back and they pass it on and they pass it on. They pass it on until the message comes to Jesus. Now, when Christ receives the message, his response is striking. He answered them. Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those and looking at those around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. That response would have been astonishing to the crowd. I mean, doesn't the fifth commandment demand that you honor your father and mother? I mean, the social expectation of the day is that Jesus would drop everything and go out and see his family. But Jesus looks at those gathered, probably his disciples, and he takes the opportunity to emphasize an important truth. That in the kingdom of Christ, spiritual family takes precedence over natural family. Now, that may have shocked the people who first heard it, but my friends, I want you to realize that's a glorious truth for believers. We can't begin to fathom the natural affection that Jesus had for his family. I mean, our, our love for our families can be great indeed, but we're sinners. We know there's selfishness mixed within it. The Gospels testify again and again of the tender love that Christ had for his mother. And what he's saying here is not, he's not saying it to reject that natural affection, that natural bond. But he's saying it to emphasize how much stronger, 
and how much more intimate his bond with his people is. And there's beautiful theology to this. Jesus Christ has come to be the elder brother of his people. What do good elder brothers do? They look out for their younger siblings. Jesus became like his brothers in every way that he might bring about our salvation. You think about the parable of the prodigal son, but, but imagine it being switched around. Imagine the prodigal goes to the far country and the elder brother comes and gets together with his father and says, we got to go after him. I'm going to go after him and I'm going to recover him and I'm going to buy him back from slavery and bring him back, father, that he might again become a son and an heir. You see, Christ's disciples were far from being sanctified here. And yet Hebrews 2 says that Jesus was not ashamed to call them brothers. And what a glorious reality for Christians. No matter what your social status might be, no matter what your background is, no matter what you have done, you can know that you are a member of the family of God. You might be a social outcast. You might be forsaken by your friends. You might be rejected by your family, as many brothers and sisters across the world are. But if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, he looks at you and he says, Behold, my brother and my sister and my mothers and my mother, I am your elder brother. And I take responsibility for your salvation, for your nurture, for your provision, for your protection. And as Christ names his family, I mean, there's, there's an exclusiveness to it. He says it's only those who do the will of God. But there's also an inclusiveness to it because he says whoever. You see, in your natural families, you're stuck. You're stuck. You're stuck with who you were born with. And especially in societies that are built upon honor and hierarchy, that's, I mean, that's a big deal. Your family determines your social status, and to a large degree, it determines your honor. And if you're born into a low class, you can, you can daydream all you want about what it would be like to be among the rich and the powerful and the noble families. But you're stuck where you are. But Jesus is saying it is not so with the spiritual family of Christ. Anyone. Anyone can be adopted into the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And Christ, sorry, rather Mark, is intentionally placing these words in contrast to the earlier two pictures of unbelief. Because he wants us to see that the great distinction in humanity is a spiritual one. There are those of Satan's household who oppose Christ and there are those of Christ's family who do the will of God. And friends, I want you to realize, by nature, you are damaged goods of Satan. Enslaved to the flesh, enslaved to lies, enslaved to darkness, damaged goods, blinded and bound. And insofar as you are left to yourself, that's your only option. You're stuck in the clutches of Satan and sin in opposition to Christ. But Jesus Christ has come into the world to bind the strong man and to set the prisoners free so that he might bring us into his family. Whoever does the will of God, whoever believes, whoever follows, is taken out of the kingdom of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. And they begin to experience now and they will experience for all eternity. The glorious blessedness being joined together in the most intimate of bonds with the God of the universe through Jesus Christ. Scripture is so black and white. Look at how stark the distinction is. There are only two options, my friends, and Mark, Mark wants us to see that. He says that again and again and again in his gospel. There are only two options, unbelief or faith. Opposition to Christ or doing the will of God. Satan's prisoner or Christ's family. Eternal destruction or eternal blessedness. There are only two options that Jesus Christ presents us with. 
And so Mark leaves us with a clear picture of the spiritual division within humanity. He reminds us that Satan has been bound and overcome. He warns of the danger of resisting the Holy Spirit. And he emphasizes the glorious richness of belonging to Christ. And in summary, he leaves us once again with that sobering contrast between the danger of opposing Christ through unbelief and the blessedness of submitting to Christ through faith. What is your response to Jesus Christ? Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, we come before you and we thank you for our Savior. We thank you that he came and he he didn't mince words. He came and he said before us the way of life and the way of death, the way of blessing and the way of cursing. And yet, Lord, we thank you that he came, not just setting that before us and saying, get to work, try hard, do good. We thank you that he came to say, I came to be the savior of sinners, to set the captives free. Gracious God, we pray that we would know him as the savior of sinners and as the one who frees the captives and as our elder brother. We thank you for that glorious testimony, Lord. May you work it in us. May you build faith within us. May you cause your word to have its effect in our hearts. We pray that you would bless us as we go into our weeks, Lord. Go before us and strengthen us to live as your people. We give you our praise and we give you our thanks in Christ's name.